I want you to make yourself comfortable. Sit as comfortably as you can. There are more cushions at the back there. You've, you've been, you sat and listened to me for over an hour, so you should have some sense of maybe uh, what you might need to do to make yourself more comfortable. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is meditation posture. Different ways of different different uh, positions that you can use when meditating. Now the first thing I'll tell you is it doesn't matter what position. It uh, you know ultimately it doesn't matter. Re- relatively some ways of sitting are better than others and uh, a lot of what is relative to you is uh, relative to is you as an individual and your own body and structure and its, its shortcomings. But ultimately you could meditate hanging by one foot from a, a, a tree limb, you know. There is, there is, uh, so you don't have to sit, uh, you don't have to sit in full lotus or half lotus or cross-legged or on the floor. You don't have to sit at all. You could stand, you could lie, whatever. Uh, the most important thing is not how you look to somebody else when you're meditating. It is making your body as comfortable as you can for the period of time that you're going to be sitting. That's the most important thing. This is about your mind. It's not about your body. It's not about sitting in a full lotus position and overcoming the agony of joints that aren't used to it. That has nothing to do with that. Uh, Now, so you want to find the most comfortable position that you can sit completely still in for as long as possible. And there actually is no such thing as a completely comfortable position because the human body doesn't like sitting still. And it's going to hurt after a while when you sit still. So do everything you can to make it hurt as little as possible and to make the uh, discomfort uh, take as long as possible to come about. That's the most important thing about your sitting position is that it be a position that is as comfortable as your body allows it to be because it's going to end up being uncomfortable no matter what. Okay? (laughs) Now up to a certain point. I'll just, uh, and and this is an important thing to, to be aware of. You will come to a point in your practice where it's no longer uncomfortable to sit. And you can sit for hours uh, completely comfortably. But it has nothing to do with the posture that you're in. It has to do with uh, what's happened happened in your mind as a result of, of the training. So you will come to that. But in the meantime, you've, and so make whatever adjustments you need to. A lot of cushions over there. Try to get as comfortable as you can for this weekend uh, and, of course, beyond that as well. But certainly for this weekend, I want you to be as undistracted as possible by avoidable physical discomfort. Okay? Everybody's already so comfortable they don't need any more cushions. Okay. That's good. <laughs> yeah, support under knee can be very valuable. Okay, I need that. Uh, <laughs> these uh, these <laughs> particular cushions are a bit on the thin side. Uh, people vary. I sit flat, but I've noticed that the majority of people, you know, they they need to have their uh, buttocks elevated somewhat compared to their knee. And uh, so you, you might experiment with using more than one of these cushions to, to sit on so that you get that uh, elevation. <laughs> now, once you've made all of the adjustments that you can to sit comfortably, then when you close your eyes and start to meditate, I want you to do your best not to move at all. 
you make all of your adjustments before you close your eyes. <laughs> and then you do your absolute best not to move. Uh, you reach a point of discomfort where, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about how to deal with the discomfort that comes up a, a little bit later on. But to begin with, the general principle is set the intention to remain motionless. You know, no, none of this kind of thing. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I just want to let people know that we brought uh, differently shaped cushions, and so you might want to try those out too. Quite a few more. Yeah. I'm hoping that you will all establish a regular practice. So you're going to want to check out the different uh, the different ways of seating. Uh, there are the uh, round zafus. This is my my dear wife Nancy back here. Who, you know, she's the secret of everything that you like about me. <laughs> this comes from her. She, but these round zafus, they they're one way of sitting. Very good. And then there is a crescent-shaped or moon-shaped kind of zafu. Uh, this example there. There's a, a meditation bench you see back there. Uh, some people find those very helpful. So there are a variety of, a variety of different uh, meditation seats. And uh, I try them out. And, and for the long term, you find the one that works best for you. Uh, also, uh, less commonly used, but for some people very helpful, there's what's uh, called a yoga strap or a meditation strap. And it's just a simple strap that goes around your waist and under your knees, and it provides a little support for your knees. And it basically accomplishes the same thing uh, as putting a couple of pillows under your knees, but sometimes it does it better for some people. So in the long term, as a part of establishing a, a permanent long-term daily practice, uh, experiment with these different things and find out what works, for, works best for you because uh, I don't know how long it will take for you to get to the point where there's no longer any physical discomfort in sitting. Could be a few weeks or it could be a few months. Uh, but in, in the meantime, be as, do what you can to, to be comfortable. And then as I say, once you've closed your eyes, you do your best not to move at all. Um, now, at some point in your practice, you may experience spontaneous bodily movements, and uh, that's a different thing. If, you, if they're completely unintentional and they're spontaneous, that's a different matter. Uh, and you just, as much as possible, allow them to be. The sort of thing I'm talking about is you might find that your body starts rocking and you're not, you're not trying to make yourself rock. It's just happening. If that happens, ignore it. But no intentional movement. What will happen with the discomfort? You know, you're sitting and this, see, this ankle starts to hurt and you sit there, okay, ah. Ah, much better. Okay. Now, oh, that's his knees. <laughs> okay. Well, let's try something else now. Oh, much better. Okay, that's good. Oh, no, now this knee. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll, you'll end up, you know, once you, once you make the first move attempting to relieve your pain, you will most likely spend the rest of that set moving, new pain, moving, old pain comes back, moving, you know, so... Rather than get into that, just try to avoid it right from the beginning. Okay. Now, the other things that are important about your posture, secondary to being as comfortable as possible, but these are an important part of it. Uh, unless you're uh, unless you're lying down, the Having your spine in uh, a, a natural position where uh, the center of gravity is compensated for by slight contraction of large muscles is what you want. Often people say, hey, you need to have your spine straight. Well, definitely straight side to side. You don't want to be le leaning one way or the other. But straight front to back is a fantasy. The anatomy of your spine is that it is shaped like this. So really when we say straight, uh, we're talking about center of gravity. You want your spine adjusted so that 
the weight of your body, your head, your upper body, your lower body, and so forth, is balanced so that with very, very minor contraction, the large muscles of your trunk will hold your body steady and still. And uh, generally, you know, a, a, an aid to that is if you can kind of point in the, in the top of your head and imagine that there was a string there and somebody was lifting you up, well, gravity would automatically put your spine in, in that balanced position. So you can sort of imagine that, that there's a string pulling up the center of your head and find that position of, of, of your spine. And that will, what, what happens if you, if you are too far forward or too far back is you start to have aches in your lower back and aches in your shoulder and things like this. And so by being in as uh, a well-balanced position front to back as possible, from your head on down will will allow you to avoid those muscular aches for as long as possible, as much as possible. When you sit, uh, you may find uh, sometimes there's a tendency for your body to very, very gradually slump forward. And if you become aware of that, then you just very gently come back to a straight position. Okay? So... So uh, spine straight side to side and in its most natural position front to back. Your shoulders, arms, and hands should each uh, should all be in a, you know typically sit like this or sit like this. Uh, what you're doing if your shoulders are level and your arms are level and your hands are level, then the weight is balanced on both sides of your body and you'll be able to sit comfortably. Uh, much longer that way. So whether you put your rest your hands on your knees, uh, I usually rest my hands uh, in my lap like this. But the important thing is, is the shoulders, arms, and hands. They're not at different levels because this this will this will cause discomfort after a little while. Your your legs need to be in a comfortable position and as I've, I've already talked about uh, uh, using cushions to support and adjust and really more than anything else it's your legs where you're going to find that that's important that just how high or low your buttocks need to be compared to your uh, knees and ankles whether you need some kind of support under your knees cross-legged now the advantage of a full lotus, if you're a l young, flexible person and you can sit in a full lotus, is it locks the body in. And it's very stable. It's if if you if you're not able to sit in a full lotus, don't even try because you can injure yourself. <coughs> if you're able to sit in a full lotus, though, comfortably, it is a very good meditation posture. And the half lotus, with only one foot on on the opposite knee is the next most stable. The most common way for people when they sit on the floor is sitting just simply cross-legged. That's most common of all. But uh, this question of, uh, of the position of the legs is something that you'll want to give some attention to because uh, uh, pain in the knees and the ankles and the hips is uh, uh, not at all uncommon the longer you sit. Yes? So what about sitting in the full lotus, but you know you can't do it for the whole time, like, you know, maybe you can go 10 minutes or 15, whatever it might be, and then when the pain is too distracting, then you switch to something more. I mean, does that, over time, will that train you to just sit in that position longer and longer? Uh, if you can, you can probably, uh, yes, you can probably train yourself. If you can sit in, in a full lotus comfortably for 10 or 15 minutes over time, you could probably train yourself sit for the full period. Uh, I would suggest that you uh, try to extend the period of being in full lotus uh, without interrupting your meditation as much as possible. Uh, in other words, if you can only sit for 10 minutes, you might try practicing extending that uh, when you're intentionally doing a shorter sit so that when the change in posture is, is, is not going to interrupt uh, what you're doing. Intention, uh, this will come up over and over again. 
when you're meditating, you would ideally like everything that you do to be the result of intention. So that uh, you don't find yourself sitting in a particular position intending to sit for an hour but having to change after 15 minutes. But, you know, that's not hard and fast. So in, in something like your situation, if you could come to a period, of, if you could come to the point of being able to sit in a full lotus for a long period, it, it would be very beneficial. But when you reach, uh, there, there's a certain point in your practice where it's not going to matter. Like I say, you could be hanging, hanging from a tree from by, by uh, one leg, you know, and it wouldn't really matter. So uh, <laughs> if if you have, if you can't sit in a full lotus, don't feel like it's a priority to start working on that, and that's where you've got to go. But if you can, it's helpful, at least at this stage. Okay, then. Uh, your your lips should be closed, and your teeth should be uh, slightly apart. And uh, the best position for your tongue is with the tip of your tongue against the back of your upper teeth and against your uh, resting against your palate. Uh, this will help. There's a tendency, as your concentration increases, for it to create a lot of salivation and swallowing. And this is going to happen no matter what. But uh, having your tongue against the roof of your mouth and the back of your teeth will tend to uh, produce less stimulation of the salivary glands than if you uh, than some other positions of, of the tongue. It's also a very natural position. I mean, try that right now. Just lips closed, teeth slightly apart, and your tongue against your upper teeth and the uh, roof of your mouth. Very natural, relaxed position. Uh, your eyes. Uh, we're going to use the sensations of the breath. Uh, most of you, at least, are, are going to use the sensations of the breath at the nostrils as a meditation object. And so, if you kind of put your close your eyes and put your attention on the end of your nose. And imagine that you're watching those sensations, not, not looking at the, if you look at the end of your nose, you go cross-eyed, right? That's not comfortable. But if you close your eyes and imagine you are observing the end of your nose, then what you'll find is your eyes will be actually oriented to a point maybe six or eight inches in front of your face at a slightly downward angle. And that is the most natural position to be stained for a long period of time for your eyes. If your eyes are, are up like this, you'll feel the strain in the muscles after a while. You know, So of all of your eye positions, the most natural one is as though you were looking at something that was out uh, several inches in front of your face. Um, it'll produce the least strain of the eye muscles, the least tension in the forehead, uh, and so forth. And it also, when you're using the sensations of the breath as a meditation object, in that position, it very much helps to focus the mind because you get your eyes on board as though they are looking at the sensations. Okay? Your breath should be completely natural, spontaneous. Just let your body breathe itself. Your body breathes itself all the time anyway. You may notice that the depth and rate of your breath changes. And you may even become aware that it seems to be changing because you're observing it. That's all right. Don't intentionally control the breath. That's all that's important, is that you stay in the role of the observer. If the breath changes because you're observing it, well, the breath changes because you're observing it. You didn't do it, your body did it. Okay? That's the way. So don't become concerned uh, if you notice changes in, in, in the depth or rate of respiration that, oh, I, I, I keep, it seems like I'm controlling my breath. Well, that, that's an eye making that isn't true. You're not controlling it. I mean, either you are and you know it and you're deliberately controlling it, 
or you're just imagining you're in control of something that you're not. So don't imagine that you're in control of something that you're not. If you find that the breath is changing, the breath is changing. Let it change. All you're interested in is that your, your intention is to be the passive observer. You have, no, you have no conscious intention to make the breath be in one way or another. Okay? Any questions about, about this? So the posture, the, the, the legs, the spine, shoulders, hands, arms, uh, lips, teeth, tongue, uh, eyes, and uh, breathing completely naturally. Let's just sit like this for a minute and close your eyes. Settle your awareness into your body. Feel that it's stable. Supported by the earth. Comfortable. In balance. Notice the position of your lips, teeth, tongue, eyes. And just become aware of the breathing in the body. Okay, now we're going to use the sensations produced by the breath as our meditation object, that which we uh, rest our attention on. But before we do that, let's take a few minutes to just sit without, you know, if you've done any kind of meditation practice before, don't do that right now. Just sit and have your only intention be as much as possible to observe what your mind is doing, okay? And I will ring this bell uh, to signal when it's time to stop. So become completely comfortable, settle your awareness in your body, and then just begin to See if you can discover what it is that's going on in your mind moment by moment.
So would anyone care to uh, share what they discovered in that process of looking at your own mind? Perhaps you noticed at first you're doing something you don't usually do. We, we don't usually look at our own minds. And so it's a little bit of an unnatural experience to start with. Anybody have that awareness? No? I bet I feel like acupuncture at a certain point where it poke, you know, certain my twitch a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then I was able to just, through the breathing, I guess, just let it go. Yeah. So were you, were you focusing on the breathing? Yeah. Okay. It, it kept me from going to sleep because it's yeah. just to go to sleep when you relax like this. Okay. Well, I, I was kind of wanting to leave that for a little while, but that's all right. That's all right. Um, what you might have noticed, though, you start out, it's, it's a little bit unnatural. Oh, here I am looking at my mind, you know. And But uh, when, when the novelty wore off, maybe you noticed that um, there are a lot of different things that you're aware of, a lot of different things going on in your mind, thoughts, sounds, sensations. And you might have experienced getting lost in one of those thoughts. So this is, your, your mind is, was at that point reverting more to its normal behavior. Um, you, as I mentioned earlier, we have a limited capacity for uh, conscious awareness, for attention. And so to function effectively in the world, to survive, uh, it's necessary that we pay attention to what's important. And there's a lot of things going on, far more than we can be consciously aware of at one time. And so part of what helps us to survive in the world is that our mind naturally goes from one thing to another looking to see whether there's anything important there. Uh, when your eyes are open, the visual field is included in that. When you're sitting with your eyes closed, sounds. You become aware of sounds. You become aware of bodily sensations. Thoughts about this and thoughts about that. Thoughts about some other thing. And so your attention, your conscious awareness, uh, jumps from thing to thing, test temporarily resting on one thing after another. And it's basically checking to see, well, is there anything anything more important going on than what I've been paying attention to so far. And then if there's something that that seems important, then your mind will tend to fix on it for a little while, to the exclusion of other things. And you'll get lost in it, right? You get lost in that one thing. And so in this little exercise, if you set out to be aware of what's happening in the mind, you got lost in something, and then you may have had that experience of, oh, I was lost in that thing. I was supposed to be paying attention to what was going on in my mind. It's a very interesting difference, isn't it? Uh, the way that you get lost in something. And this is the normal way for your mind to behave. It will stay on one thing as long as it seems important and interesting. But then sooner or later it will start looking around for something else more interesting, just checking to make sure that, uh, that there's not something else that needs to be attended to. When you set an intention, that intention becomes part of the collection of things that your mind can check in on. And every now and then it'll check in and, oh, I'm not doing what I intended to do. So this is the normal way for your mind to behave. A good, beneficial way for your mind to behave. To be constantly checking all of your sensory fields and all the different thought processes that are taking place. Uh, And let me just point out something to you. I don't know if you notice this in this very short time, that as we continue practicing and meditating, I want you to become aware that there are a lot of different thought processes taking place in your mind at the same time, most of them sort of subliminally. 
kind of out of sight, but you just kind of notice here and now that, yeah, the, and now and then that here, yes, it, 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 they are taking place. There are these different, a lot of thinking going on below the surface. Thoughts, concerns, memories, did I do that? I need to do this. Uh, what should I do about that? This person shouldn't have done that to me. And so on and so forth. And it's all just kind of going on. And, and the ones that you're really aware of are the, the ones that either your mind lands on and holds for a little bit or the ones that come up strongly in, in your awareness. But So there's a lot of different things going on in, in your mind. Your mind is a busy place. And as I said, your mind's not one thing. It's not one thing, it's many different processes taking place simultaneously. Each one with its own agenda. I mean, ultimately they're all working towards, uh, in, in one form or another, towards the agenda of trying to make you happy and keep you safe and, uh, and, and free from pain and suffering. But all these different processes are going about it in different ways. So there will be a... Uh, an unusual or obtrusive sound and your mind will go to it. What is it? Identify it. Is this important? Do I need to worry about this? Ah, no I don't. So it'll go on to something else. And that's good. That's the way it should be. So when you start to meditate you find your mind will do what it's always done. It, it will, you, you say, okay, I am going to focus my attention on sensations of my breath. It doesn't take very long. The mind says, okay, been there, done that, let's go look for something else. Right? That's what happens. And that's normal. That's normal. How do we overcome that? Grit our teeth and say, I'm going to stay with the breath this time. <laughs> Does it work? It'll never work. <laughs> so let's look at what's, what's, what's happening. Okay. What I want you to do is now, this time, we said, um, I want you to place your attention on that uh, some place in the region of the tip of your nose where the sensations of the air as it moves out is, is, is easily discernible, particularly clear. And it, I'm not talking about a location of any particular size, you know, quarter inch, three quarters of an inch, two inches, it doesn't matter. But if you close your eyes and put your attention here, as the air moves into your nostrils and out, there are some clearly discernible sensations present. So just look at that now. Might be actually at the rim of your nostrils, might be inside your nose, might be your upper lip, might be some combination. Now, those sensations, these are going to be your meditation object. You're not meditating on the breath. Although for convenience we may refer to it that way. What you're really meditating on is the sensations that are produced as the air moves in and out. The sensations in that area. Did, was everyone able to uh, clearly discern the sensations of the air moving in and out with the breath? And anybody that wasn't? This is this is very good. Most people can, and it's a very good location. Uh, and uh, some people, though, have a problem with it. And so, as an alternative location, is we can observe the sensations that are produced as the abdomen rises and falls with each breath. But if everyone can discern the sensations of uh, the air moving in and out of the nostrils, that is actually uh, the best. The, that's that's the best. 
but even when I say that that's the best, there's particular reasons why that's the best, but keep this in mind. It really doesn't matter. A meditation object is just a tool. And if somebody had trouble, uh, and sometimes they do in a group this size, usually there would be one or two people that have a problem, and I would need to suggest that they use the sensations at the abdomen, which are not quite as good. They're a lot coarser, so they're easier to, to uh, uh, clearly observe. But uh, as you continue on into practice, their very coarseness makes them less useful as, as an object. But you could even use sensations in your chest or shoulder. So, uh, but if you can, if you can use the sensations of the air moving out of the nose, that's the best. That's what I want you to use. Okay. So that's our meditation object. What we're going to do is we're going to set ourselves the objective of not losing that awareness. We're not trying to change anything else that's going on in your mind. All that we want is not to lose that awareness. And uh, our longer term goal, and maybe you'll, you'll, you will uh, achieve it before we're finished here, I, I hope so, is to be able to sit for uh, 45 minutes or an hour without ever losing that awareness of the sensation of the breath, no matter what else is going on in your mind at the same time. But it's very important to be clear. We're not trying to stop other awarenesses. We're not trying to stop other mental processes. We're not trying to do anything else. We're just trying to remain aware of the sensations of the breath. And for those of you who have meditated in the past, this may this may be a point that you didn't really pick up on in instructions before. You're not trying to change anything else. You're trying to do the positive act. You're not trying to eliminate anything. You're not trying to stop anything. You're performing the positive act of remaining continuously aware of these sensations. And you're going to start off recognizing that it's not going to happen that way at first. Your mind is going to observe these sensations for a little while and then go look for something more interesting. And it may jump around to a lot of different things and it may keep coming back to the breath. Sooner or later, it's going to find something else that is sufficiently more interesting than the sensations of the breath that it stays on that other thing. And the longer it stays on that other thing, the more likely it is that you're going to forget about the sensations of the breath entirely. At some point, it's going to land on something. Your attention is going to land on something else and it's going to stay there so long that you forget about the breath. We'll call this forgetting. Forgetting happens because the mind doesn't stay still. It, there's a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff going on. And the longer you look at the sensations of the breath, the less interesting that is by comparison with everything else. And so the more likely it is that your mind is going to go to something else and stay there long enough to forget about the breath. And then when your mind forgets about the breath, it's going to have a tendency that once it gets tired of the new thing, it's going to go find something else. And that's going to trigger by association a thought about something else. And then when it gets tired of that, it's going to go to something else. We call that mind wandering. So forgetting leads to mind wandering. And so you're going to experience that. And, and that's nothing different than what your mind's doing all the time every day anyway. Eventually, as your mind wanders around, it's going to come back to that original intention, which was to observe the sensation of the breath. And you are going to have this experience like waking up. It's like, oh, yeah, I was supposed to be doing that, wasn't I? And I want you to notice the difference between that and the moment before when you were lost in whatever it was that you were thinking about. Because it's that awakened awareness. It's that, oh yeah, that's, that's wonderful. That's what you want. That's what you'd like to have all the time, is knowing what's actually going on and knowing whether it's what you want to be going on or not. Do you see what I mean? So, what you don't want to do 
is... Oh, darn! My mind's wandering again. Okay, I have to go back to the breath. Don't do that. No negative thoughts, no disappointment, no frustration, because what's going to happen is what's going to happen. You know, and you didn't do something wrong. It's not your fault. Don't get mad at your mind. This darn mind of mine, it won't do what I want. Don't blame your mind. Your mind's doing what it's supposed to do, what's normal for it to do. This is going to happen. The question is, how can we change this? So, by shifting your attention around, looking for something that's interesting, important, your mind is doing something that is normal, that helps you to survive, that's actually crucially important to your normal survival. By getting mad at yourself, you're not going to make your mind stop doing something that is so important. Negative reinforcement, punishing yourself because your mind has done something that you didn't want it to do, is going to have absolutely no beneficial effect. So get rid of it entirely. On the other hand, another completely normal thing that your mind has done is to discover that it's not, that the activity of your mind does not correspond to your intentions. That's normal too. Positively reinforce that. Encourage your mind to do that. Make it your goal to have that happen more often and more quickly. If you succeed in that, first the periods of mind wandering become shorter because it happens more often and more quickly. Then maybe there's temporary forgetting but no mind wandering at all. The mind doesn't even go to the next object before bingo, oh, I realize, uh, time to go back to the breath. Okay. And then eventually you'll know, you'll feel, become aware when the mind is drifting before you've lost the awareness of the breath. That awareness will come at that point. So the whole key to developing, uh, uh, well, to this part of developing uninterrupted continuity of awareness on a single object is positively reinforcing the normal and natural behavior of the mind that makes you aware when the activity of the mind is deviating from your intention. How do you do that? Well, the first part is very important, and when we sit here in a few minutes, I want you to focus on it in particular, that uh, look forward to when your mind has wandered, because it's going to give you the opportunity to savor this. And this is that feeling of suddenly being more fully present, more aware, more awake, more fully conscious when that moment of real because that's what that moment of realization that your mind has wandered is it's becoming more present and more fully aware you can obliterate it by hitting yourself over your head because oh darn my mind wandered but don't do that instead savor it appreciate it enjoy it positively reinforce it okay and then it doesn't matter how many times your mind wanders or for how many sits the mind wandering keeps happening. All that matters is that you positively reinforce the arising of that awareness, that uh, awakened, more fully conscious state so that you reinforce it so that it happens more often and more easily. Okay? Now just before we sit, I'll give you another little thing that helps, which I'll go on uh, and go into more detail later on, but it's just important as we begin here that this be a part of it. It is when you are directing your attention to the sensations of the breath, you want to try to engage as fully as you can within that process. So there's going to be a lot of other things going on in your mind. 
but you want to preferentially be more aware of the sensations of the breath. Now, once again, what is it that causes your mind normally to engage more in one thing than another? It Sometimes it's intrinsic interest. And that won't last very long with these sensations. But the other thing is when we set goals and objectives for ourselves, when we have challenges, this is a way of bringing ourselves... To, isn't this how we learn to do all kinds of things? We learn to play golf or... or uh, any other kind of sport or activity is challenges. I want to be able to do this better. Uh, okay, and, and you have specific goals. I want to be able to play the whole scale without any uh, differences in, uh, in the length of each note. You know. So you do this with the breath as well. What does the breath consist of? An in breath and an out breath. And so there are sensations produced by the in breath. And they're quite distinct and separate from the sensations produced by the out-breath. Which means, of course, that there is a point in time that we could identify as the beginning of the sensations produced by the in-breath. And a point in time corresponding to when those sensations disappear at the end of the in-breath. And that is distinct from uh, the occurrence of the beginning of the sensations that occur with the out-breath, and likewise the ending. And the other thing that you'll notice is that there's a little pause between the end of the in-breath and the beginning of the out-breath. There's a brief pause. And the end of the out-breath, the beginning of the in-breath, there's a brief pause. So to begin with, <coughs> a little bit of a challenge that you can give your mind to help remain engaged <coughs> with the breath as long as possible is to try to notice exactly when the in-breath begins and exactly when the out-breath ends. Right. Okay? And see, and, 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 and likewise with the out-breath, when it begins and when it ends. And when you find that you can start doing that clearly, then become aware of that pause between the inhale and the exhale. Okay? This gives you a little bit of a challenge. To start with, you'll find the beginning of the in-breath oh, really easy to spot. But where the in-breath begins, that's ah, a little more subtle, you know. And you, you just want to come to the place where you can observe all these stages in the cycle of the breath with equal clarity. And, so, and that will help you to engage. Now another thing that I'm going to suggest that you do is that you count up to ten breaths. This will help you to keep your attention on the breath. If, you know, uh, if you count uh, in, out, and mentally say to yourself one, and then in, out, two, and then when you get up to ten, then stop. What you might find is that you forgot the breath after the third. When you, when you become aware of that, and when you, after you've taken a moment to savor being aware of uh, coming into that awareness again, we'll start it over again. But once you've reached 10, stop and then continue without the counting, okay? And then if you, uh, if you find that um, uh, you're, you're starting to lose the awareness of the breath more often and for longer periods of time, use, use a counting of 10 breaths once again to, to See if you can bring yourself back into a more engaged state. But at no point judge yourself or create expectations that lead to disappointment. What I want you to do, we're going to do this for about 15 minutes. It's the simplest thing in the world. All you have to do is to observe the sensations of the breath. And then if at any point you realize that you lost that awareness... <coughs> savor that coming back into awareness and then gently bring your attention back to the process of watching the breath again. Easiest thing in the world. So after 10, start at 1 again? Up, okay, let me just be clear. You might, when you first begin, uh, 1 to 10, uh, if you don't make it all the way to 10, start over. If you make it to 10, stop counting. Unless you find that later on 
you start having a lot of mind wandering and you feel like counting ten breaths will help you. But this is basically something you do uh, at the beginning and then thereafter only starting over again uh, to go to ten uh, if, if it seems like it'll be helpful. And this is, this is your judgment to make for yourself. Is it going to be helpful for me to count the next 10 breaths or not? But your success now is not going to be in terms of, of how often or how long your mind might have wandered or how long you're able to stay with the breath before your mind wanders. This, that's not what success is about. You will have a successful meditation now, provided that you remain calm, relaxed, and happy, and just simply observe the breath as well as you can. Positively reinforce the recognition whenever you've lost that awareness, and gently bring the breath back again. As long as you do that without becoming uh, attached to outcomes and annoyed at yourself or anything like that, you've had a wonderful meditation okay so let's do this we're going to do this for for 15 minutes and I'll guide you a little bit here so get comfortable and begin with putting your awareness in your body just become fully aware of your body the weight of your body supported by the cushions and the floor Be aware of your body. You're sitting here in this room, in this place, your eyes closed. And you're breathing in and you're breathing out. And now bring your attention to the sensations of the breath at the nose. And begin to observe them. Trying to notice the beginning and the ending of each in and out breath. And counting until you reach 10. And once you've reached 10, start over as often as you need, but once you've reached 10, don't count any further. So here we go.
if your mind starts to feel agitated, bring your awareness back into your body for a moment or so, a minute or two, and then go back to the breath. Stay completely relaxed physically and mentally.